welcome to lecture 28. So, <coughs> today we will, I uh, will briefly recapitulate whatever we have done in the lambda calculus and then I will talk about data as functions, right. Uh, so, so let us just briefly go through the pure calculus. So, we have the syntax uh, given a countably infinite set of variable symbols, you have uh, every variable symbol is a lambda term, a lambda abstraction is a lambda term and a lambda application is also a lambda term. We have the usual notion of free variables, we have the closed lambda terms which have no free variables or called combinators, we will be looking at some co important combinators and the operational semantics of beta reduction um, is as follows. So, the main rule is that of uh, finding an application and replacing the bound variable in the body by the operand which simulates function application. And of course, there is the notion of syntactic substitution which we have rigorously defined before. We can, of, we can take the reflexive transitive closure of the beta reduction and obtain uh, a many step beta reduction uh, by these rules uh, and uh, we also looked at, uh, uh, we also and just to make clear what our notion of free variable substitutions are, as I said for our beta red x, we require the notion of free variable substitution which somehow has to be very carefully defined and this is our definition going from here on to here, right. Uh, yeah. So, <coughs> we will we will take this as a definition though it is not completely algorithmic. Uh, it is possible to give this definition entirely in terms of uh, entirely in terms of free variables without worrying about these bound variables and then make it algorithmic but then that is harder to understand. We will follow the simpler route here, okay. And uh, we also looked at the notion of alpha, uh, we also looked at some strange kinds of things which, are no, which normally do not happen with functions. For example, we saw that functions may be applied to themselves, something that uh, is otherwise unheard of um, and actually does make sense for a function to be applied to itself. On the other hand, it also does not make any sense for certain functions to be applied to themselves because they lead to infinite non-terminating computations. Um, so, it means one has to be somehow careful. The difference between these two is something that we will look at later. One is that this is a polymorphic function and therefore, it is not really self-application whereas, uh, this is really self-application and that way we will see that self-application by itself has to be banned, right. And uh, then uh, we also looked at alpha conversion uh, which is essential somehow when you have to uh, for readability for doing your beta conversions without uh, creating collisions or uh, confusions. So, this definition of alpha conversion here uses the definition of uh, free variable substitution and also this alpha conversion includes the syntactic identity, right. So, uh, if so L is alpha convertible to itself, I mean that is that is the moral of the story. So, and uh, um, okay, and we'll take Z to be a f fresh variable different from any in this. Again, it's possible to redefine alpha conversion such that uh, it's only necessary to look at free variables in certain bodies. But we won't worry too much about it. Um, okay, um, now with this notion of alpha conversion, what we would like to do is uh, the alpha conversion basically tells you that two terms whose 
which are different only in terms of bound variables are essentially the same. They are almost syntactically identical and that even in you, you really cannot distinguish them on the BS basis of any meaning or operational semantics or any such thing. So, what we will do is we will include alpha conversion in our definition of beta equality. So, the new beta equality is defined as follows. If L is alpha convertible to M, then L is beta equal to M. And uh, if L goes in a many step beta reduction to M, then L is beta equal to M. If L is beta equal to M, then M is beta equal to L. If L is beta equal to M and M is beta equal to N, then L is beta equal to N. Uh, these, these three were the original rules which really tell you about the reflexive transitive closure of uh, the many step beta reduction. And this is a new one which says that every now and then while doing beta reductions we might feel compelled to rename some bound variables therefore alpha convert to another term which is not syntactically identical but which is alpha convert uh, which is alpha equivalent uh, and we will claim that they are both beta equal. Uh, so, the, uh, so, so our reflexive transitive closure actually includes alpha convertibility too. So, that now we do not need to worry too much about alpha conversion which is always uh, uh, which is which adds to the confusion and does not add anything new to the meanings of terms. Right. So, now getting back to the title of this lecture namely data as functions. The important thing to realize is that um, there are essentially several models of computation, right. If you get back to this data as functions, what we are trying to say here is that if you, if you were to go through an architecture course, uh, what, what is the main goal of an architecture course? Firstly, it tells you that there is really no difference between program and data. Program and data both have the same representation namely I do not know various kinds of bit representations and they have the same representation. So, it is a matter of interpretation whether some bit string is a program instruction or a data or a piece of data. I mean the whole the whole idea of a von Neumann architecture which is what you study in most architecture courses is really this that there is nothing really there is nothing fundamentally different between programs and data. <coughs> programs are not any different from data it is a matter of interpretation. You can interpret certain bit strings either as data or as instructions. So, there is no difference between data and control and the important feature about any architecture uh, a, a, a course would be that all control and all programs are represented in the form of data right in the sense that your, uh, the, your uh, machine instructions are all uh, expressed in some bit strings, uh, your jump instructions are bit strings. Uh, so, they are all coded into data. Okay. So, all, all control is coded as data and data is coded as itself of course. So, so, the, so the, and the whole point is that depending on convenience you decide. So, so very often you actually, you actually logically partition uh, let us say areas of memory into a data segment and a code segment and you interpret some of that uh, whatever is in the code segment as control and whatever is in the data segment as data. But it is really a large it is largely a matter of interpretation and there is essen no essential difference between the two. Now, in the, in the case of the lambda calculus what actually Church did? was that what he showed was that yes programs and data are no different, 
of functions and data are no different and that all data are functions which is a reversal of part of the fundamentals of architecture, right. So, there is no difference between programs and data or control and data. In his case, it is functions and data and data, all data can be represented as functions, right. So, the important thing, so in, in this, uh, what, what, what we are, what, what we have looked at so far is not only the pure lambda calculus, it's what it's what might be called the pure untyped lambda calculus. Yeah. So the first thing is that the first thing to realize is that it's not really necessary it's not really necessary to have to apply the lambda calculus uh, uh, to have an applied lambda calculus. In theory, it is not, it's not at all essential. In theory, what it means is that our application like taking the pure lambda syntax and applying it on to something like piano arithmetic is not essential. I mean, you can get rid of piano arithmetic completely because what we will do is since all data are going to be representable as functions, piano arithmetic can also be represented as functions. And so, it is possible to work with just the pure lambda calculus, you do not need to apply it, ok. It is a matter of taste whether you want to apply it or not, but largely if you look at functional programming languages, they are all applied lambda calculi, but they are all applied lambda calculi for reasons of efficiency. The, 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 ba the basic thing that has happened in the last 50 years of the existence of computers is really that you should be able to exploit the speed of hardware. Hardware is very fast, anything that is programmed in hardware is likely to be very fast. So, instead of actually coding, coding up all uh, data structures as functions, it is more efficient to use the underlying data, data structuring capabilities of your machine hardware, ok. So, you want the power of the lambda calculus which means higher order functions, but you do not want to, you do not want to work with a pure lambda calculus simply because even though the pure lambda calculus can represent all the data you require, it is going to be extremely slow. So, what you do is you apply it onto an existing virtual machine whose operations are likely to be very fast. Since the underlying hardware is going to be very fast and is getting faster every day, it makes a lot of sense not to try to code everything in the pure lambda calculus, but to use the underlying data representations of the underlying hardware and code only what is very difficult to do with the underlying data representations. Remember that the whole the whole von Neumann thesis is is not just is not that you cannot write higher order functions in in hardware, it is just that it is extremely hard to do it, it is extremely complex. So, what you do is you exploit the hardware to the hilt. I mean, for example, the integer arithmetic is very fast on hardware. No amount of simulation using lists is going to get you that speed. Whatever is programmed in hardware or at most firmware is likely to be 5 to 10 times faster than anything you can, than the best algorithms you can write in software. So, you write you always, so that is, so it is a, it is a good pragmatic reason to use only the applied lambda calculi and which is why all functional languages are applied lambda calculi. They provide this excellent structuring facility for higher order functions, but even though the pure calculus can structure data just as well as uh, data itself is, 
it's it makes a lot of sense to apply it onto existing on an onto an existing virtual machine and develop and so get the benefit of the structuring me mechanism of uh, the the lambda calculus coupled with the speed of the underlying virtual machine yeah so that's really the main reason why all functional programming languages can just be regarded as applied lambda calculi right but uh, as a matter of academic interest it's a good idea to know that uh, i mean it's it's it goes in parallel with uh, let's say what 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 you learn in an architecture course in an architecture course essentially what you learn is the representation of all data and functions as data and if if an architecture course has to be summarized in one sentence that is just the, the represent it's the representation of all data and functions as data and uh, a good idea is to look at uh, the the lambda calculus pure lambda calculus uh, theoretically at least to be able to program all the data themselves as functions and so it provides a parallel okay so some of the we we'll, let's first go through some of the important combinators that uh, that will uh, that we will see and then uh, and then maybe uh, we will look at uh, this uh, data structuring uh, facilities numbers and data structuring facilities so uh, one of the most so three the three most important combinators are these yeah i mean so, so what's a combinator a combinator is a closed lambda expression so that it has no free variables yeah so closed lambda expressions uh, are what provide the capability I mean they, they have the status of full programs to which data can be supplied and they can be executed yeah. So, this is this i is the identity function. So, you apply it to any uh, you apply it to any object and you get that object okay. by object I mean that that ob since we are talking about the untyped lambda calculus that object may be a value object or it might be another function okay so whatever it, so this 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 combinator i is polymorphic in the sense that there is nothing specified about this type x the type of x whether this type of x is a value object or a function object or a higher order function you can apply this i to any function and you should get back the function. So, it is a so if if you have a function supposing you, you are using this i in an applied lambda calculus in which you have a function from some domain a to some dom, uh, some codomain b okay. Then this so the function f a arrow b when i is applied to f then i acquires the status of having a type a arrow b goes to a arrow b right. So, so if you take a so if you have so if you look at an object x let us say in integers okay, and you apply i to x then i is a function uh, a combinator is a function of the type integers to integers. On the other hand, if you took a function f from integers to integers, okay, then and you apply i to f, you get back f. Then i really has the status of having the type integers to integers. That means it takes a function from integers to integers and gives you another function which actually happens to be the same which is integers to integers okay you can take any function of any type and i applied to that function will give you back the same function in each case if if you have a function f which goes from some type a to some type b then i of f is a function from i applied to i applied to f is equal to f and therefore i has the status of being from 
a applied to b arrow a applied to b. So, what I can do is I can parameterize. So, I is polymorphic in the sense that depending on the argument, it has a varying personality. Yeah? If the argument is a plain integer, then I has this personality of a function from integers to integers. If it is a plain boolean, then I has a personality which is like booleans to booleans. If if, if, if i is applied to a function from integers to integers or integers to booleans, then i takes a personality which is of which is that it is of type integers to integers to integers to integers or integers to booleans to integers to booleans. So, what it means is that in general instead of looking at these various types formed by constants. I can just as I can talk of value variables, I can talk of type variables. So, then I if alpha is a type variable, then I is of type alpha arrow alpha. Okay. And this these types are what you see in your ML interpreter. When you define a function, it determines a type if it can determine the type by means of a constant, I mean if there is a distinguishing constant, then uh, of course, the type <coughs> is very uh, determined in terms of those constants. I mean so, you can look upon types themselves as a language, okay, whose constants are things like int, bool, real and so on. And the functions are arrow types formed of these. In the case of a function, uh, a combinator like i, <coughs> What it is saying is that you take any type alpha, so alpha is a variable over the types and i is a, I is a function then of type alpha arrow alpha. Yeah. So, so one thing is one thing that is possible, we will talk about polymorphism in the type lambda calculus in, in a certain in a little bit of detail, a large part of it is still a matter of uh, fairly current research. Uh, so, but there is quite a bit of material which is uh, which is already quite well known especially ML type inferencing and so on. Right. So, uh, similarly most of the other combinators you can assign them a type in that way. Okay. In the case of twice the two applic the, the applic so twice is also polymorphic in a similar fashion. Okay. In the sense that I can assign type variables to the type of twice and then I can try to solve for those type variables. Solving for entirely for type variables means expressing one type variable in terms of the other. If I cannot do that as in the case of uh, the omega combinator that I, sh that I showed uh, that as in the case of this, the self. So, so twice self application is polymorphic. Whereas, the omega combinator which is defined this way is not polymorphic. It is possible to do a type inferencing for twice, but it is not really possible to do a type inferencing for omega. Okay. It is possible to assign some type variables and some type expression to twice, but it is not possible to do that for me. And that is what distinguishes genuine self application from merely polymorphic application. Yeah. Anyway, so we will go into that uh, in some detail later, but for the moment just look at these combinators. So, just keep in mind that we are starting at the beginning right at the in the beginning in the primordial mush there is nothing I mean and you are extracting functions, values everything from essentially a homogeneous mass of nothingness. Right? So, um, here is a combinator k 
if you look at the combinator k, it basically given two arguments x and y, it returns the first argument. Yeah. Uh, then there is this combinator S which is actually very important, but I do not really want to spend time uh, explaining it. Uh, its form is such that for three arguments x, y and z, it is of the form x applied to z, the whole thing applied to y applied to z. Its importance is, is really that with S and k, you can program all of the combinators. I mean they are the absolute primitives you require. Uh, for j j with just these two constructs, essentially all functions that are programmable can be programmed. Yeah, uh, but that's a matter of doing something. Do we, uh, it's a matter of study after you have uh, finished your theory of computation course. But uh, till then, you just keep in mind that S and K are very important. Uh, this 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 combinator is just just tells you about how to compose functions together. Function composition is again again polymorphic, right? I mean, after all, regardless of the domain in which you are, you can always compose unary functions. If yeah, so this is a function composition, and then let's look at the actual representation of data. So the first thing is truth values. So the truth value true is just the combinator k. So given to um, given to functions x and y, it chooses the first one and that is true. False is just choosing the second one given to functions x and y, uh, uh, given to objects x and y, if you choose the second one and that is false. Yeah? So, this is uh, quite, uh, this is a bit like, uh, I mean it is, you can see the similarity here it is functional, but in your architecture it is really data based. I mean you have only two possible values of, of uh, data uh, from which data is all formed 0 and 1. So, one of them is false and the other is true. Right? Um, so, it, it really does not matter which one you take. So, and then let us look at so, uh, we will just quickly look at the data structuring capability. So, one thing that we have to do is find uh, is to be able to define various data structuring facilities. And what are the data structuring facilities? Uh, Cartesian products, uh, disjoint unions maybe, but forget about disjoint unions, sequences. We need to be able to construct sequences. So, pairs, tuples, sequences, and if you've got them, you've essentially got everything else. That's everything else that is required theoretically, but is not required pragmatically. As far as functions, uh, so on and so on, arrays are anyway functions, and functions anyway you have. I mean, that's the whole purpose of the lambda calculus, right? So, how do you define? Uh, so, we will define a pairing function. Okay. So, I am so now uh, I am following the um, following a convention now. I am using dark green for combinators constructed from lambda expressions. Yeah. So, sometimes do not get confused. So, it would be a good idea if everybody had 5, 6 colors to write with. Uh, so, so do not get confused when I use a green square bracket, do not confuse it with the blue square bracket which is part of the lambda calculus uh, language. Okay. Uh, so, here this is a pairing function which takes two arguments and uh, this pairing function is just defined by this combinator. Okay. Now, in all our data structuring facilities, we had essentially two kinds of operations. One is the constructor operations, which allows you to construct complex data from simpler data. And the other is a deconstruction. How, how do you get the simpler components? from a complex piece of data. 
Yeah. So, so this is the constructor for pairing and this is the deconstructor. So, I will call the deconstructor this and what it means is that if I have a lambda expression uh, P which is actually supposed to denote a pair of elements which, which presumably was formed through the construction operation through this construction operation not any other. Okay. Then P applied to true will give me the first component of this construction and P applied to false will give me the second component. These are things that you can verify by actually doing the lambda application. Remember that this bracket is the I mean this is this is my representation of the deconstructor operation. Okay. It is in green. This blue parenthesis represent actual lambda application. So, that means you take the combinator P to which you apply the combinator true and see what you get as a beta through beta reductions and of course, our beta reductions now include also alpha conversions wherever necessary. Yeah. So, if true anyway is the combinator K right, which given two arguments gives you the first argument. Okay. So, when you apply for example, take this if, if P was indeed if P, P see remember one thing P could be any lambda term. Okay. And strictly speaking you could apply this deconstruction operation on any lambda term. It is just that if you apply it on any lambda term then the chances are you would not be able to interpret what you are getting in some reasonable fashion. But if P had been constructed through two terms M and N using this constructor, then when you apply true here what happens? You get true applied to M, the whole thing applied to N. True applied to M, true is just K, K applied to M applied to N means that it will give you the first component, it will give you M. Right? Similarly, P applied to false will give you the second component and it will give you N. But remember that this, this thing since we are, we are in an untyped world, you can actually construct any, any arbitrary lambda expression and say that this somehow represents a pair, though you may not have constructed it through this fashion. You can apply P, you can apply that combinator to true and get some result which does not make any sense to you. Okay. So, this is something that is sort of uh, natural. I mean uh, what I mean is uh, here again I mean we actually had an inkling of that in this. I mean if you say true has the same representation as k then uh, you know can I apply k to something else to a pair and claim that I am applying true to some pair and getting some truth value. I mean it is a the type the type of value you get is largely a matter of interpretation. After all uh, I mean this is this is something that as, as, as a very young person I used to do. I used to have these Fortran programs and then run them through the Pascal compiler just to see what kinds of errors come. I mean, so it is really a matter of interpretation, right. I mean, you can apply anything to anything, uh, you can send any file into a Pascal compiler. I mean, uh, what, what you get is anybody's guess. So, similarly, you can apply any combinator to any combinator. After all, the language syntax does not disallow you from doing that. But what you get is undeterminable. So, these combinators the fixing of their types, the fixing of the kind of values is largely a matter of interpretation. After all, I mean I can take cosmic ray data and try to execute it. You know, I mean I get a whole sequence of bits of zeros and ones, why cannot I regard it as a program and try to execute it? Right? And what will actually happen I do not know, some glitches will take place somewhere, something will happen. But 
What I mean is it is a matter of interpretation whether you get something meaningful or not. In an untyped world which is what your underlying hardware is, there, there are no types, there is no distinction between programs and data. So, what prevents me from executing data? Right? So, similarly in the untyped world of the lambda calculus what prevents you from applying some strange combinators to strange other strange combinators what you get is anybody's guess. Okay. So, I can interpret this the construction and deconstruction operations only under certain conditions. For example, what prevents me from just incidentally forming an expression which has this syntax? Why should it why should I interpret it as a pair at all? Okay. Similarly, there is nothing that prevents me from doing this application to any arbitrary lambda term and seeing what I get. What I get is not necessarily the first element of a pair. What I get would be the first element of the pair only if that lambda term was obtained by this pairing constructor. This is a fact of life in the untyped world. Whether it is program or data, it does not matter. Any untyped world, there is a problem of interpretation. This, these operations are not surjective, I mean they do not go back and forth uh, necessarily always, but case. they go back and forth only if you go through the construction operation and then the deconstruction operation. Okay. So, 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 so that is one of the problems of the untyped world, right? I mean, so you can take an arbitrary lambda term and deconstruct it first and then then try to do the construction and see whether you get the original lambda term. No, if your arbitrary lambda term was not of this form, then you are not going to get the original lambda term. See, if your arbitrary lambda term was of this form, then sure you will, but if your arbitrary lambda term was not of this form, then you are not going to get it because when you do the deconstruction, you will get some strange lambda term m, you will do and, and a strange lambda term n and then you will apply this construction and you will get a lambda term of this form and which is not necessarily going to be beta equivalent to what you started out with. So, but when we start with true and false, so do not we expect something like when, when, the, when we do it in, Boolean, in the Boolean world, then true plus false equal to 1 and something like that. True hey, hey, no, I mean that is that's, that's the problem, you are mixing up an untyped world, I mean why should true plus false equal to 1? That is, there, there is not anything else possible. That is. When we take a function, apply true to it, take a, take a function, apply false to it, yeah. and then in some way try to come get it back, it will always get back the same function. No, no. What, the only thing that is guaranteed is if you go through the constructor first and then do the deconstruction, then you will get back what you originally had. If you do a deconstruction and then try to apply a construction, then there is no guarantee what will happen. That is how the untyped world is. Okay. Uh, what what Barendrecht has proved in way back in 1974 is that there is no perfect possible construction and deconstruction operation for pairs which will ensure that construction and deconstruction are in, in, in are somehow inverses of each other under all circumstances, okay, which should answer your question. What it means is that if you do a deconstruction and then do the construction from the what you get out of the deconstruction, you would not necessarily get the original thing. Yeah? So, right. So, and uh, the most natural thing to do when you, I mean and it is a good idea to play around with these things to see what happens you know with your data structuring. I mean it is, it is I mean why, why should we, why should we play around only with Pascal compilers and Fortran programs. I mean we can, we can do that also with combinators. I mean, apply the, uh, let us say, I mean apply the successor function to a sequence and see what you get. I mean you can, you can do all these kinds of things. I mean after all there is nothing that really prevents you from seeing what horribly complicated expressions you get. Yeah. So, 
so this is how the pairing is goes. Once once you have the pairing, uh, it's very simple to construct tuples. So uh, the pairing is through Cartesian products, right? I mean, and tuples are also Cartesian products. And if I bracket my Cartesian product, if I take a Cartesian product. a 1 cross a 2 cross up to a m. I can look upon this as a Cartesian product which is obtained by a binary Cartesian product. Take the Cartesian product of this with the next and so on and so forth and I keep on bracketing. The other possibility of course, is to look upon this Cartesian product as looking at such Cartesian products. Okay. So, that I get right. Now, so, I can look upon an NRE Cartesian product. So, I can I can look upon an NRE Cartesian product which I will just write like this. Okay. As being isomorphic to binary Cartesian products. Okay. So, these things are isomorphic. This is isomorphic to this is isomorphic to this. <coughs> so, what it means is I can take a by an NRE Cartesian product and either I can look upon it as binary pro Cartesian products done one way or binary Cartesian products done the other way or I can also have mixtures of these right. I mean I can choose some k and uh, somehow do a 1 to a k and then a k plus 1 to a m and take it as a binary Cartesian product in that. So, it is isomorphic to a whole lot of possibilities, it is actually isomorphic to all possible ways of bracketing uh, that you get. Yeah. <coughs> so, we will just take one of these. So, we look upon a tuple as just obtained as an ordered pair, a tuple m 1 to m n is an ordered pair whose first component is m 1 and whose next component is an n minus 1 tuple, whose first component is m 2 and whose next component is an n minus 2 tuple and so on and so forth. Yeah. Since we have a pairing construction operation, we know how to find tuples. Essentially what we are, what we are using here is one of these isomorphisms. Yeah, for the representation of tuples. Right. So, and as as usual, we require for tuples. We can and we can take since the our tuples are constructed from pairs. Our deconstruction operation for tuples, which basically means projection functions for the tuples can also be constructed from the pairs, from the deconstructions for pairing. right? So, if you keep on deconstructing the tuple, you can in a certain fashion, you can get the, the ith component of the tuple. Yeah? So, which, which essentially means that if p has been obtained by an explicit tuple construction mechanism, then uh, to get the kth component of this tuple, what I do is I do the pair deconstruction k minus 1 times. Okay. If I do it k minus 1 times, so if I have this, if I have this tuple of this form m 1 to m 2 to and so on and so forth m n minus 1 m n. 
So, if I have this tuple, if I do this uh, pairing uh, deconstruction for pairing n minus uh, k minus 1 times, then what I have is a tuple whose first element is m k and whose next element is another tuple okay, of size uh, I mean of n minus k. Uh, a tuple of n minus k elements, it is an n minus k tuple. And now what I do is I take the first component of this and that is what actually happens here. So, um, you take the right hand component each time of this pair, do it k minus 1 times and then take the first component of what you get, right. And for the nth element, you always take the rightmost element. So, you do this n times n times perhaps n minus 1 times n minus 1 times n minus 1 times yeah and you always get the take the right component yeah so uh, and that should give you your so these are the deconstructions operations for tuples right derived from the deconstruction operation for pairing right. Um, so, now let us look at sequences uh, uh, ok here. So, here uh, so uh, we had the first confusion with these parentheses because they this parentheses when in blue are lambda applications parentheses when in green are deconstruction operation for pairs and tuples. Uh, for sequences I have square brackets. So, square brackets when blue are lambda abstraction, square, square brackets when green are actually sequence constructions, yeah. So, the, a simple method of forming sequences, uh, if you actually look at your programming, uh, that the, 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 the tuple formation is really like your list constructions in ML or Lisp or whatever you know it is like having a cons operation and so on and so forth. The cons operation is really like pairing, successive pairing. I mean there is an alternative way of looking at them, they, you can look at sequences this way, whole sequences as just a lambda z, a z applied to m 1, applied to m 2, applied to and so on and so forth up to m n and, uh, and then right and then you have this uh, deconstruction operation like this which i don't want to go into great detail about it uh, if you if you actually play around with it you will be able to see that this is the deconstructor yeah uh, this pin is the deconstructor which extracts the ith component of the sequence the n gives you the fact that it's n if the sequence is n components long, then the ith component out of n is going to be this and we are in the untyped world. What it means is firstly you can apply this p i n to any particular any lambda expression that fancies you that takes your fancy, it may not even represent a sequence, you can still apply it and get something. What you apply it? God alone knows what you get after application God alone knows. You could even take a sequence that is let us say much shorter than n elements long and try to apply p i n where i is greater than the length of that sequence. You will get something, you will get some other lambda term because a lambda term applied to a lambda term will give you a lambda term. But what it means again God alone knows. Okay. Here again only when you go through the constructor operation and then do the deconstruction you are liable to get back your original component. If you go through the deconstructor operation and then go through uh, the constructor, uh, constructor you do not know what you will get and in the untyped world there is no such thing as an error. Okay. I mean after all errors are a logical uh, are a logical 
uh, consequence of an interpretation. In your actual hardware, you actually set some condition codes and detect errors and detect certain patterns as errors. But otherwise, if you just look at the bare hardware, oh, what is an error? There is no such thing as an error. It is just bit patterns, that is it. Take it or leave it. So, similarly here, there are no, the concept of errors again is a matter of interpretation and you just get lambda expressions, take it or leave it. And errors are really uh, a, a higher level abstraction from the untyped world. I mean, they are not part of the untyped world. Right? So, if you do erroneous applications, you will get something, but to interpret it as an error is, is a matter of your taste, is a matter of what you consider right. For example, you may not like the idea of a deconstructor followed by a constructor apl application giving you some actually something that is meaningful, then you call it an error. You will still get a lambda term whether you like it or not. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so maybe we'll stop here and I'll do numerals next time, and I'll do the uh, y combinator.